title of the message is The Worst Type of Famine. I'm not trying to trick anybody. I think you don't know exactly what, where I'm going in that text right there. But I'm going to come back to Amos um, chapter 8 in a little bit. So you can hold your place there. And then also, if you would, mark your place in Lamentations. Go back a few books to Lamentations 4, and I'll be reading a little bit from there here in a minute. <clears throat> in the Bible, we see a lot of mentions of famine. And perhaps in the United States, we don't really completely understand what that's like or, or why that's such a, such a big deal. Um, I did see a few studies, um, maybe you've heard these before, but apparently there is hunger in America, hunger in the United States. There are people that are supposedly starving in the United States. And I found it very interesting. I was reading this article about it and they showed pictures and they showed uh, pictures of different people throughout the world or whatever. And it showed in the United States, these families that are starving and they're going through the uh, uh, some kind of uh, food you know, food bank place or whatever, they're getting food. And the weird thing about it was they're all overweight, <laughs> but they're starving, but they're overweight. <laughs> okay. And Hey, here's one point that I want to make. I don't know if I'll get back to this or not, but, but just think about it. You could actually be overweight and still be starving. Okay. If you think about that, if you're not getting the right nutrients or whatever. Uh, so I'll talk about that, but for the most part, <clears throat> most people in the United States, a little bit overweight, you could probably last months without food. As long as you got some water to keep you alive, uh, you would, you'd, we'd probably make it. <clears throat> but we don't understand famine. Like people like get to this desperate point where they're going to, they're going to die. So they got to eat something, you know, to keep them alive, no matter what it is. Somebody once said in a survival uh, situation, you can live three weeks without food. Uh, that's a, that's a normal situation. Some people could live a lot longer than that. Uh, some people could possibly die before that, depending on their situation, what's going on. But on average, they say uh, it's a rule of threes. They say three weeks without food, three days without water. Again, that could go either way, but that's that's an average. Or three minutes without air. Uh, so like if you're in the water, you know, after three minutes, that person's pretty much, you can assume that they're, they, they didn't make it or in some kind of sealed environment and something caves in on them. If they run out of oxygen, they've only got minutes uh, probably less than three minutes, really, uh, but but to to live. But then somebody added this in one uh, book that I wrote. I read on survive uh, survival situations a long time ago. They said they went through all those threes, and they said, but you can only last. Uh, you can't last three seconds without hope, which sounds real great. But you know, they were trying to make this point, like you know, if you don't have a will to live, you know, you're not going to make it. I would say this from a spiritual standpoint, you know. You can't live. Uh, you can't live spiritually without a desire, you know, to do so. And that is something uh, to consider. Something I'm going to talk about here in a minute. So in Amos, God talks about a curse that He's bringing uh, that is worse than a famine of food and water, and it's a famine of hearing the word of God. Uh, verse. Uh, uh, you know, you held your place in, in Lamentations. I'm going to go ahead and read that again in Amos. Amos 8, 11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Now, we don't know maybe necessarily what the, the, it feels like to be desperate and panicking for food, looking everywhere for food. How am I going to survive? I mean, we might, some of us might feel like that after a couple hours, but it's not real desperation. <laughs> okay, we're talking about people who are literally uh, dying because they don't have food. Uh, the Bible uses a lot of illustrations of actual famines that happen in the land. Uh and, uh, you know, there's, these were all pretty severe situations. Let me give you a few examples just so you can see uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, you can lose uh, Amos. We don't need to go back to Amos, but, uh, but keep your place in Lamentations and look it back to Genesis. We'll just go through a few uh, popular verses in the Bible that talk about famine. Genesis chapter 12. 
we'll kind of go chronologically here to help us out a little bit. Genesis 12, verse 10 says, And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. So here's a man that lived in tents and he had, you know, he knew how to live off the land and he had animals and he understood how to do all that. Probably knew how to hunt, I would assume. Uh, his his, his uh, servants were armed, the Bible talks about and everything. So I imagine that that means that this famine was had gone on for quite a long time and it was in a pretty severe state that they had to go down into Egypt uh, to, uh, to, to get some kind of substance. Look at uh, chapter 26. In chapter 26, Isaac uh, ends up going through a time of famine. There was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And uh, so here we see that his, Isaac's going to go through another great time of famine, goes back into Egypt. I'm not giving the context. It's not important for the message. Look at chapter 41. Chapter 41, verse 26. So you remember this, uh, the, the Pharaoh had a dream and he's trying to get somebody to interpret it. And Joseph says, oh, I can, you know, God can interpret your dream and tell me. So verse 26, this here's he's interpreting the dream. He says, the seven good kind are seven years and the seven good years are seven years. And the dream is one and the seven th thin and ill favored kind that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be uh, seven years of famine. If you're not familiar with the story, the context will tell you what he's talking about here. This is the thing which I which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be gotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of the famine following, for it shall be very grievous. And for that uh, the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because that, this, uh, that that thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Anyway, so he's ex describing a time that's coming where he says it's going to be seven years of famine, which is a long time to go in a severe uh, famine. Look at uh, chapter, actually go to the book of Ruth. Chapter 4, verse 1. In the very first chapter, it explains how uh, this family went into... Moab, how they got into Moab and how they were introduced to Ruth, actually. Okay, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Okay, so that's how they get introduced to, uh, to Mo the Moabites because of this great famine that was in the land. And they had to go to another, another place. Now look at 2 Samuel 24, just a couple of books over. 2 Samuel chapter four, uh, 24. Here's an interesting story. This is, this is the last one I'm going to give. There, we could give a whole bunch, but here's an interesting story where David sins a sin and God says, uh, you know, he numbers the people and God says, I'm going to have to punish you for that. But this is an interesting situation because he said, I'm going to give you a choice. There are three different punishments I'll give you. Okay, look at 2 Samuel 24, verse 10. Or he says, I'm going to let you choose between one of these three punishments. Chapter 24, verse 10. And David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I, in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. For when David was up... In the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer, I offer thee three things. Choose the one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come, up, uh, come upon thee? 
sorry, come unto thee in thy land? Or wilt thou flee three months before the enemies while they pursue uh, before uh, while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in thy land? Uh, now advise and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. So he gives them this choice. He says, look, you can have three years of famine or you can have three months of fleeing from an enemy that's pursuing you. And you're just going to have to constantly be fleeing, which David didn't like that. He was pretty used to that uh, already. And then he said the third one is three days pestilence. Now, if you keep reading the story, he says, you know what? Here's my answer. I'm going to just leave it all in God's hands. Let him choose which of the punishments to give me. And I uh, just hope that he's going to be merciful to me. And you say, well, which one would be the most merciful? Well, here's what I know. He gave him three days pestilence. Uh, look at verse, uh, I think, verse 15. Let's see here. Yeah. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan, even to Beersheba, 70,000 men. Now, I don't know how many would have died in a famine. But if that was God being merciful and he said, I'm just going to send three days pestilence, this disease that's going to come wipe out a good portion of the people, uh, you know, who knows what the famine would have been like, you know. Now, this is interesting because uh, you could go and I'm not going to go there right now, but you go to Matthew 24, Revelation 6. We've talked about this a lot and it talks about the end times where there's going to be pestilence and there's going to be famines and there's going to be wars and earthquakes, all those kinds of things. And if you think about that, uh, it's going to probably be pretty bad once you get to Revelation 6 and you begin to read about those those types of things and how many people are going to die because of the famine. And then you read about, you know, how hard it's going to be like an entire day's wage just to get, you know, some bread. And, uh, and we're talking about some serious situations. And I believe the whole world is going to go through that. Maybe it'll affect certain like richer nations last you know, so if the if United States is still in the shape it's in, maybe it'll get like the end end of it. But, you know, some places are really going to struggle. A lot of people are going to die uh, because of these famines that are coming. Now, we don't know exactly. It says they're very grievous or they're sore upon the land or whatever. But we don't know exactly how bad all these famines were. We just know they had to get out of there. There was no food. Uh, people were dying and that kind of stuff. But we do have... Uh, an example in the Bible, a couple examples where he tells us the, the extent of what some famines were like. Not necessarily the ones we just talked about, but the famines that were going to come in that time. And I think they also point to the picture of the famine that's going to come in the end times. Okay, uh, I believe, you know, pretty close right before the Lord comes back, uh, we'll go through this time of famine. Look at Deuteronomy 28, and then we'll finally get to... Uh, lamentation where I told you to hold all this time. Deuteronomy 28. And this is uh, going to be some stuff I don't really like reading, but it's such it's so powerful and it's in there for a reason. So we're not going to avoid reading it, but it's some kind of hard to stomach stuff. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Look at starting in verse 53. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body. That's talking about your children. The flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee in the siege, and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee. Now I'm going to tell you this. If we're ever in a time of famine... You don't have to worry about me eating you. I'm not going to do it. I just guarantee you, I'm not going to eat one of my children. I'm not going to eat at you. I wouldn't eat my worst enemy on this earth, okay? It's not going to happen. You say, how do you know for sure? I know I wouldn't eat the person, all right? <laughs> I'm just telling you. Uh, I would uh, I would die, okay? And so uh, uh, here's, I believe, what's going on. He's saying this is going to happen. He's not saying, like, this is just going to be a normal thing to do uh, because then he goes on to talk about, uh, these people that I believe are probably reprobates is what I'm thinking. It says, So then the man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eye shall be evil toward his brother and toward the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children, which he shall leave, uh, so that he will not give to any of them the flesh of his children whom he shall eat, 
because he hath nothing left him in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee in thy gates. The tender and delicate woman among you who uh, would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for, delicate, for a delicateness and tenderness. Her eye shall be evil toward the husband and, uh, of her bosom and, the, and toward the son, uh, her son and toward her daughter and uh, toward her young ones. I mean, who? what kind of mother would be even thinking about that. But yet we see that several times in the Bible where wicked people get to that point of famine where they're willing to even eat uh, their own children and, uh, and toward her children, which she shall bear. For she shall eat them for uh, what? All things secretly in the siege and uh, straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee in thy gates. Okay? And again, I hate reading that. It's, it's disgusting. But God's saying it for a reason because it's true. Number one, people will get that. People are that wicked in the world. Historically, we know stories, uh, the Dahmer, Dahmer party, everybody always re refers to that one, uh, where people were, you know, uh, went down in a plane wreck and they had to survive. And so this community just started like rationing off people. And, 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 and it's just, uh, it's hard to fathom, but people, number one, are so wicked that they'd be willing to do that. Number two, so desperate, you know, and if a person's not really that concerned about other people, but they're desperate and they need to stay alive, they might uh, do something like that, okay? So we're talking about a pretty desperate and harsh type of famine, a pretty serious, uh, serious thing. Look at Lamentations 4. And after I read this one, go ahead and hold your place there because we'll, we'll be looking at a few verses. This is kind of like the main text here. Even though I had Brother Austin read Amos, this is, a, this is our text. Lamentations chapter 4. Starting in verse 4. The tongue of the sucking child cleaveth to the roof of his mouth for thirst. The young children ask for bread, and no man breaketh it unto them. They that did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet and braced dunghills for the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of thy people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom that was overthrown as a mo uh, in a moment and no hand stayed on her. Her Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body and, than rubies. Uh, their polishing was a sapphire. Their visage is blacker than a coal. They are not known in the streets. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. In a withered, uh, um, it is withered and has become like a stick. We're talking about people that are so sickly and so famished that they are, they are like a stick person. And uh, that idea about the being black as coal, if I understand right, there's certain diseases you can get like scurvy and stuff. They, they used to get scurvy on the ships because they would get sick. And, 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 and uh, if I understand right, their skin would turn black and uh, their teeth are turned black and all this kind of stuff. It is withered, it has become like a stick. They that be slain with the sword are better than they that be slain with hunger. For these pine away, stricken through for want of the fruits of the fields. Uh, the hands of the pitiful women have sodden their own children. They were their meat in the destruction of the daughters of my people. So we're talking about some pretty harsh famine. I'm not talking about somebody just got hungry, their crops didn't grow one year or something like that. We're talking about a long period of time, probably years. In some cases, it was like seven years of famine. After a couple of years of rationing everything that people have gotten and they've like borrowed from each other and they've done all this, you know, they got to a point where there was nothing they could do. There was nothing to scrounge up, have a hard time finding anything to consume. And so they start taking uh, some, some drastic measures. Okay, but the famine that God talked about in, Am in Amos 8, he says, I'm going to send you a famine. He didn't necessarily say it's worse, but from a spiritual standpoint, you know, we're talking about the same type of a famine. But he says, I'm going to send you a famine, not one of, of, of being hungry for bread, not being thirsty for water, but a famine of hearing the word of God. All right, and I'm going to tell you this, like I, I, as a Christian, 
You know, the worst thing in the world is to be, would be to be uh, uh, starving and have a famine of God's word where you can't hear from God. You can't hear God's word. It's not resounding in your heart and, uh, and, and having an effect on your life. Uh, you might think, no, 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 that wouldn't be that bad. You know, what would really be bad is not being able to eat for seven years, seven years, like the, the, the type of eating that I want to do or something like that. No, spiritually speaking, though, spiritually speaking, a worse kind of famine is to have a famine of the word of, of God. And so I don't want to, uh, I studied Amos. I read that through a few times and was trying to break it down and studying a little bit about the prophet and uh, how he's preaching to Judah there and things that were going on during that time. I thought really none of that applies, okay, to what I'm, the point that I'm wanting to make. The point that I want to make is simply this. When people are desperate for food, because of famine and they're hungry and all that, they would do certain things, okay? And so I want to make a comparison to people who are in desperate need, okay? They're in a spiritual famine of the hearing of God's word. <clears throat> there are three different things that they'll do, okay? And so if, if you don't understand the application very well, so what I'm talking about is <clears throat> people who they don't have the word of God. All right. Now that could manifest in different ways. I just recently preached from uh, Hosea chapter four. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Okay. Uh, and what he was saying is, you know, my people are destroyed because they don't have the, the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Right. So what's the fear? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of, of knowledge or the beginning of wisdom. And, uh, and the, the reason that they are destroyed is because they have no fear of the Lord. They have no, no wisdom. They have no understanding. Uh, they don't know God's word when it comes down to it. And I remember I was talking to them. This is just uh, last Sunday night. And I said, you know, there's only, there's only a few reasons that you wouldn't have the word of God. Okay, number one, you just don't have it. Like it doesn't exist. Like there's places in China, other parts of the world where Christians, you know, have tried to smuggle a, just a portion of the word of God and they've hidden it in the places and they try to memorize it and then they pass it on to the next person so they can memorize it. And then they try to find another piece of scripture. I mean, where the word of God is so precious because they don't have it. And if we didn't have the word of God, we knew it was out there somewhere, but we didn't have it. Boy, we'd be desperate to our soul. Like, I need to hear from the Word of God. I need to know what God's Word is. Uh, I needed Him to speak to me through His Spirit, through His Word, and uplift me and give me the spiritual nutrients that my body needs. But if you didn't have the Word of God, you know, that would be problematic. Now, how many think that the problem in the United States is we don't have the Word of God? <laughs> I mean, we got several copies in probably each of our bedrooms. You know, you can come to church and get free copies. We got Bibles, you know, to uh, give away. They're in front of you. And uh, uh, nobody, we don't want anyone to leave without a Bible, right? We want everyone to have, by the way, and, and look, they're King James Bibles. I'm not talking about like anything that, uh, you know, even if it just like, uh, we have New Testaments, but I'm talking about the whole thing. Old Testament, <laughs> we got the whole thing and it's King James and, and all that. But, you know, there are some people that it doesn't matter how many you give them. They're not going to read it, right? And so another, so anyway, but another thing is this: some people have it, and they're just like, ah, I just can't understand that. It's just not making sense to me, and and I just don't. I'm, I'm not really uh, motivated to read it or whatever, which indicates a big spiritual problem. You know, sometimes uh, obviously a person that's not saved wouldn't be able to understand the Bible is spiritually discerned. Okay, but the Bible says this: that they uh, uh, that in order to hear, they need a preacher. Right? How can they hear without a preacher? And so another reason people don't have the Word of God is they just don't have anyone preaching it. You know, there might be a lot of books on the shelf with pages, but they don't read it. They're not getting the Word of God into them, so they don't. it doesn't do them any good. It doesn't matter how many Bibles we, we, we sell in the United States or we have in the, our houses or whatever. <clears throat> but, you know, if somebody can just happen to go to church once a week, two times a week, three times a week, praise the Lord, uh, three to thrive, they used to say, and uh, you don't have that opportunity here necessarily, but, uh, three times, you know, every time the door is open, you go and you're getting some preaching, uh, man, that's a, that's a blessing, uh, to have, you know, somebody who's going to get up and they're going to preach you. They're going to feed you, you know, even though you're not eating for whatever reason, they're going to feed you the word of God. But the problem is a lot of people, you know, they might have, they might go to a church, they might have a preacher that gets up behind the pulpit, but he's not really preaching. 
And he's not at least not preaching anything of, of value and substance. And uh, I'll talk about that here uh, a little bit in a second. But uh, and then the final thing is just pretty obvious, like they have the Bible, they have preaching. You know, certainly there's enough preachers in this in the United States that everybody, at least in the United States, should be able to drive to a place that preaches the gospel and and preaches the word of God. And and, uh, you know, probably could even find a place that goes soul winning. You know, it might be hard, but they can probably find it uh, in the United States. So, uh, you know, so here are the things that happen, though, when you don't have the word of God and you're in a time of famine. Think how serious uh, a famine is that we're talking about. So here's the things that we see from our text here in Lamentations 4 that they that they do. Number one, if you don't, uh, if you're in a severe famine, here's something that you'll do. You'll simply get sick and you'll die if you go long enough without eating, right? If you just stay in the current position, current situation, you'll just die. No nutrients, no word of God. And, uh, and you'll ultimately die. Let's look at a few of those verses again. Verse 4. To start out with, chapter 4, verse 4, The tongue of the sucking child cleaveth to the roof of his mouth for thirst. The young child ask bread, and no man breaketh it unto them. Look at verse 8. Their visage is blacker than a coal. They are not known in the streets. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. It is withered. It, become like a, uh, it has become like a stick. We're talking about people that are very, very, uh, very sick. And what, in fact, not just dying, but would rather die than have to endure that. Look what it says in verse 9. They that be slain with the sword are better than they that be slain uh, with hunger. For these pine away, stricken through for want of fruits of the field. You know, the, it would come to a point where you're so desperate, you're hurting so bad, you're like, you know what? I might as well just die because I can't live in this, this state. Well, you know, your soul can kind of get sick like that. Your soul, uh, look, everybody in here probably has gone, you know, quite honestly, if I skipped, I know I'm the pastor, so it's not going to happen, but if I, if I skipped one day out of the week where I didn't go to church, I'm talking about like, you know, you go Monday, I mean, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. If I skipped one of those days, uh, one of those opportunities, I would feel starving spiritually. You know, and I've had a lot of people talk about this where they go on vacation or something like that and they come back and they're just like, man, I've gone too long without hearing preaching. You know, I've too long without being around God's people, too long without, you know, and we can, we obviously, we can read the Bible on our own. You need to be doing that, right? You can't really, you can't really survive and thrive. I know they said three to thrive, but you can't really survive off just what the preacher feeds you a few times a week. You've got to be reading the Bible. You've got to be praying. You've got to be, you know, finding ways to be fed. You know, there's nothing wrong with being spiritually fat, man. You do, get the midnight snacks, right? <laughs> Find a good preacher and listen to a good sermon. Uh, you, need to, you need to fill yourself up spiritually. There's no reason to be starving. But look, physically, there's no reason to be starving in the United States. I know some people would get mad about me saying that, but it's true, right? Most people, if you look into the situation while they're starving, there's a lot of answers. And one of the answers isn't because there's not enough food in the United States, okay? Uh, so, so the same is true spiritually. There is no reason for any of us uh, to be starving spiritually. The Word of God's there. You got a preacher. Uh, if you... If you my if it, if my preaching doesn't taste good to you, there's a whole bunch of other preaching that I would recommend to you that would be good preaching you can listen to, and uh, you can be fed spiritually. Otherwise, you're gonna get sick and you're gonna die. So that's the obvious, that's the given. But then what happens in desperation? Okay, people are are spiritually in a famine here. What do they do? <laughs> well, look at verse five. It says that they embrace dung hills. Embrace dung hills. Uh, chapter 4, verse 5. They that did feed delicate, delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet embraced dunghill. So you're talking about these people who always had everything. They always had the best of the food, the finest meats, the finest uh, desserts. And, and I know a delicate there doesn't necessarily mean uh, desserts. You know, you think about uh, delicacies like meats and stuff like that. But whatever the case, they had the finest food. And they're dressed in scarlet. They're in the fine clothing and all that. And, you know, they never, ever, ever would have gone to 
a dunghill looking for food or the garbage can looking for food or whatever. You know what a dunghill is, right? The Bible uses the word dung. That's talking about when someone goes to the bathroom, ours goes in the toilet, goes in the sewer, right? But they would have places where it would actually pile up, you know, in different, uh, uh, different scenarios. Okay, could you imagine like trying to get food that's already been processed by an animal or human and thinking like, well, I'm going to die if I don't eat something, so I'm just going to eat that. That's the most disgusting thing that you could think of probably right now. Okay, now think about how that applies spiritually. You know, when people are starving for God's word, they will embrace a dunghill. Well, what do you mean by that? Look, I've heard people who I don't know why they're not satisfied with the Bible and with God's word and just the simplicity of it and preaching to them. They will go after the strangest doctrines, <laughs> like bizarre doctrines. They'll go, after, they'll go after false preachers and start falling into all these false gospel teaching and all these uh, different things. Or they'll go to some church that's like a social club and they don't even have preaching, but it's like I'm trying to find some kind of fulfillment, some kind of spiritual satisfaction. So they'll, they'll go there and they'll just try to, you know, play games and, and get friends and, and do all this kind of stuff. But I'm telling you, it's not going to satisfy the soul. It's like trying to embrace a dunghill, right? Think about you could be eating at the king's table. You could be eating, feeding yourself uh, like we do on Thursday nights. Amen. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we could be feeding yourself spiritually. And yet we're just like, oh man, I'm starving. I need something. And we're digging through the dumpster, you know, we're, we're trying to find something. And it's like, come on. You know, I marvel, uh, I marvel at how many people have come to Iola Baptist Temple and driven, and some still do drive, a far distance to come. And I, in all sincerity, honesty, I asked them, I said, what in the world are you driving this far for? I could help you find a church that's closer to you. I'm not a great preacher. I know you didn't come to listen to me preach. And they said, you don't understand. I've had people come from places where I know there's a lot of churches, but they say, look, I've tried all those churches. And when I go there, it's just like junk food. And it's just like garbage. And it's just like, it's not feeding the soul. They say, I want to go somewhere where they simply talk about the Bible they preach sound doctrine, you know, they love each other, they want to go soul winning, all these kinds of things. These are good for the soul. And some people are in places of the world or even in churches, sitting in church sometimes three times a week, and they feel like they're starving. They feel like they're not getting anything. That's a bad situation. And, uh, and, and I would sure hope that nobody would ever feel like that here. If you are, tell me, man, I'm not being fed. And we'll see, I'll see what I can do, okay? Uh, because there's no reason for you not to be fed. So they get sick and they die, uh, or they get desperate, they embrace dung hills. Here's the third thing that it says in the text, verse 10. <clears throat> the hands of the pitiful women have sodden their own children. They were, uh, I'm sorry, they were their meat in the destruction of the daughters of my people. The third thing people would do in desperation in the severest famine is they eat each other, right? Or worse yet, eat their own fruit, right? Their own uh, family, their own children, you know, they'll, 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 they'll eat them. And they'll like, basically what they're doing is they're trading that person's life to satisfy their own, their own soul, Okay. So how do we apply that? Well, boy, there's several things going through my mind that aren't even in my notes right here about how somebody can do that where they, you know, the first thing, I didn't have this in my notes. I wasn't going this direction, but when it came out of my mouth, I thought about this. You know how many people uh, trying to grat gratify their own soul will basically just throw their children, you know, to the side, you know, and I, and I still, you know, I think about the public education system and, uh, you know, whatever, some people do it. And there's, you know, we, a lot of us came out of public school. We survived. I get all that. But as a parent, just thinking about just dropping off that little kid and then just turning around. And I've heard people that, you know, they just say, I just got it. I got to ha have a break. You know, I got to get away from my child. You know, I have to have some time to get some things done or I have to have some me time. And I just drop their kid off at school and let the public school like teach them teach their children. They have no idea what's going on behind those doors. 
And you hear stuff on the news all the time that, you know, you, you actually what you usually hear on the news is like whenever it happens at a church. OK, and I'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> but it happens in public schools, too, and they keep on sending kids to schools. Right. And so uh, uh, look, there's and, and not to mention just the garbage that they're being taught. All right. But that's a public school. I know that that's not I'm not talking about spiritual things. OK, so let me explain uh, what happens spiritually. A lot of times in churches, we do the same thing and we just pawn our kids off and we say, you know what? They can't get anything in the main service. So we're just going to send them in, in uh, there. You have no idea what's being taught behind those doors. You have no idea what's going on. And you hear stories all the time about kids being, uh, you know, abused or something like that in a church setting. And uh, look, I've been in children's ministries a long time. I know ch good churches that have strong children's ministries. I, I'm not gonna. I'm not trying to belittle them. I understand it. My heart still goes out for it. We just picked up a girl the other day because we went uh, soul winning, and the dad said he was pagan and he didn't want to come. And then he said, and then in the morning he said, "Hey, my daughter wants to come." And so I sent my wife and my daughter, and I said, "Well, you know, we want her to come to church and get her saved." But look, I, I'm torn sometimes because I'm like, "Yeah, they want to come. I want to get them saved." But what I decided a while back is that I, I, you know, I just don't want to keep opening that door where parents get this mentality that I'm just going to go and I don't want to deal with my kids. I don't want them to be, you know, crying or disruptive or whatever. So I'm just going to pawn them off to who knows what so that I can be spiritually fed. Right. And that's a bad thing. That's almost like just eating your own child. Right. Now, that wasn't even in my notes. I just kind of came to me. OK, so here's the other thing. Here's what I was thinking about whenever I was writing this sermon. You know, what? I notice in a lot of churches, they have a reputation of eating and devouring each other. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Uh, there's a lot of times churches, praise the Lord, I don't see that here. Everybody gets along really well, far as I can tell. And there's a fellowship is good. People hang out after services and we're talking, we're enjoying each other, asking about each other, praying for one another. As far as I can tell, all that's going good. But I've been in a lot of churches where it's not that way. I've been in a lot of churches where, you know, People sit on one side of the room and they're like this and the other person on the other side of the room. And boy, I, that would be hard. It would be hard to pastor a church like that. There's places where, you know, they're just constantly attacking each other online or they're fighting with each other. Or maybe, you know, the church is OK. They're not fighting among each other so much, but they're enemies with this other church. And so they're attacking this other church all the time. And here's what it just kind of dawned on me as I was reading this and thinking about that. Hey, sometimes... What that means is it could be a sign that, that for whatever reason, they're not getting the right nutrients that they need to just from God's word. They're not getting the right nutrients that they need to, uh, uh, to be spiritually fed. And so they're trying to find something. And so they're like devouring each other. I mean, uh, that's what it seems like uh, to me sometimes. If, uh, if, uh, if people are, you know, if you're, if, if you go hungry, let me see. How do I say this? If you continue to uh, to starve yourself, okay? Now, we're talking about famine. We're talking about people getting desperate and all that. But, you know, you, you hit this point after you've gone so many days without eating where you don't even really notice that you're hungry anymore. I don't know. Maybe a few of us have ever hit that point, but it's true. Uh, you go long enough without eating. People in nursing homes, this is really, really bad. OK, because what will happen is they'll, they'll go so long without eating. They're just like, I'm just not even hungry anymore. And they will literally die of starvation because they, they won't eat. And so if your loved one's not eating, you actually have to say, look, I know you don't want to eat, but you got to eat this. And you're like forcing them, forcing them to eat, you know. And so sometimes when people are not getting the nutri nutrition that they need, you know, it's just because they just don't want to. And they've gone so long without it. And uh, and again, Going without it doesn't necessarily mean it's not there, that it's available or that there's a preacher that's preaching it. Uh, you know, here, here's, here's what happened. There could be a preacher that is feeding all the food. I mean, he's got a good gourmet, you know, meal, very nutritious, got everything. But it could be that some people in the church are kind of like broccoli. I hate broccoli. I'm not going to eat that. Beans. No offense, Sharice. <laughs> she, she would eat them if she was starving. Beans. I'm not going to eat beans. And, you know, it could be that the, the preacher is up there serving these good meals, but the people are like, eh, not interested, not interested. And after a while, they're just like starving themselves of the nu nu nutrition. They're like, you know what? I'll just go, I'll just go get a, 
a cheeseburger afterwards. <laughs> I'll go get it. And you know, actually, there are people who, who like I was saying earlier, who are saying, "Hey, I'm hungry. I'm starving. I feel like I'm dying because I'm not getting enough food," and they're overweight. But the reason they're overweight is because they're filling themselves with junk food and doesn't have the nutrients. And, and, and if you get the nutrients, look, I just started back on a diet, okay? So you'll hear a lot of this stuff. But you get the nutrients, protein, for instance, you get a good source of protein, you're full. I mean, I, I like carbs and carbs aren't bad, but if you just ate all carbs and you never ate protein, you'd be like, why am I so hungry? I just ate, right? Well, because you didn't get, you didn't get the protein. Say, well, I just don't really, I didn't really feel like eating that. I wanted a, I wanted a bowl of cereal. I wanted, you know, some little bit of a carb or something like that. Well, look, well, then you're going to be hungry and you're going to be, you know, uh, starving your, your, yourself of the nutrients that you need. And it's the same as thing, the same is true spiritually. Like some people just want the candy. Some people just want the, the fast food. Some people want, you know, have you ever met someone that grew up? If it's you, don't raise your hand. But you ever had someone that grew up and all they ever ate was like cheeseburgers, pizzas, you know, microwaved, uh, you know, I don't know, hot pockets or something. <laughs> and uh, and so like when you offer them some kind of new food, something that's you know got something that's actually green or or whatever, and they're just like, oh man, I've never eaten that. I don't I don't want that. And you're like, no, this is what you need. You need some of this food. OK, <clears throat> but there are some people who just refuse to eat any of that because they've lived off of the junk food and all that for so long. And so eventually their body is like very unhealthy. OK, so so we need to spiritually be thinking the same way. Like I, not every not every sermon has to be and I'm not accusing anybody. I'm just saying this is just application of the message. Not every sermon has to be just the right kind of sermon like you like. You know what I mean? Just to fit your needs and, and something that kind of gets you stirred up or whatever. All we really need is to get the nutrients from God's Word in us, however we can get that. And so we need to read the Bible and try to make the application. We need to le uh, you know, listen to whatever the preacher is preaching. And, you know, maybe he gave us the text. Uh, maybe we didn't completely read, know what he was saying. So we go home and we read that chapter again and, and maybe come to him and say, you know, hey, I didn't get anything out of this verse or what were you meaning by this? Or can I, hey, ask me, I'll do, I'll do the best I can to make sure that you get fed. All right, but we need to decide ourselves that we are going to, uh, uh, to be spiritually fed. We're, we're, we're not going to rely on, we're not going to get sick and we're not going to die. We're not going to go embrace dung hills and we're not going to eat each other or eat our own, okay? We are going to just enjoy the multitude of blessings that God has given us in His Word. And the multiple opportunities that we have to hear preaching, uh, you know, good grief, everything. I mean, you could come, you could come to all the all the Iola services without even getting in your car. Just turn on the live stream, and listen to it. And again, if you're just tired of you going to hear so much of my preaching, I'll help you find some other preachers, right? But you can get spiritually fed. And again, also, I would say this: don't just listen to the preachers all the time. You need to be reading yourself. Uh, you know, it'd be kind of like going to a restaurant all the time. You know, you need to learn how to cook a little bit yourself. You need to learn how to throw some things together and get some nutrients at home. And so read your Bible, drink water, right? I'm talking about, I mean, in real life, you probably need to drink more water too, but I'm saying drink the water of the word. You know, it'll, it'll just fill your stomach, your tongue won't be cleaving to your mouth. Your skin won't be turning black and, and you won't look like a, a spiritually look like a stick, stick man. <laughs> okay you will get some meat on your bones, spiritually speaking. All right, let's pray. Father, I uh, pray that you'll help us to be spiritually fed, each and every one of us. Uh, I, as a pastor, have to be fed uh, as well. I need to understand how to feed the people. And Lord, I just feel like I need to have all the ingredients and all the... Uh, uh, the substances available and resources available to me, Lord. So I pray you equip me with that so that I can uh, feed the people. And I uh, pray that you feed them. Your spirit will do the work in feeding them and restoring their souls. And I pray that you will just uh, help us as a church to be spiritually fat and spiritually filled uh, so that we wouldn't have time to embrace dunghills and we wouldn't have uh, time to, uh, to eat on one another. 
uh, because we enjoy the blessings you've given us so much. I pray that you continue to uh, bless the church, be with those who couldn't be here, those who are sick or in uh, different situations that have kept them from being here. I pray that you'll uh, help get them back uh, to uh, congregate with the saints again. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.